Asian uh, Approaches to Development Cooperation webinar series on the topic of uh, changing landscape of development cooperation amidst and beyond COVID-19 in Asia. Our first session moderator is Anthea Mulakala, Senior Director uh, of International Development Cooperation at the Asia Foundation. Uh, over to you, Anthea. Thank you very much, uh, Kyung Sung. Good, good day to everyone and all participants, and welcome to the Asian Approaches to Development Cooperation webinar 2020. As Kyung Cook said, my name is Anthea Mulakala, and I'm your overall moderator for our three day virtual event on the changing landscape of development cooperation amidst and beyond COVID 19 in Asia which is jointly hosted by the KDI School of Public Policy and Management and the Asia Foundation. I am joined by my behind the scenes coordinator, Kyung Sung Lee, who I'm sure has been in touch with every one of you at some point over the last few weeks. Our three sessions are spread over three days and they will examine how efforts by Asian actors, government, private sector, NGOs and multilaterals how they collaborate across borders to address the COVID-19 pandemic and are shaping the future of Asian development and South-South cooperation. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers and topics for you, and I encourage you to tune in for all the sessions. We appreciate the time you've taken to join us. We will kick off this three-day event with a recorded welcome from Gordon Hine, Senior Vice President of the Asia Foundation. Good afternoon, everyone, and greetings from San Francisco. My name is Gordon Hine. I'm Senior Vice President of the Asia Foundation, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar on the changing landscape of development cooperation amidst and beyond COVID-19 in Asia. This webinar is the latest in our ongoing series of meetings on what we call Asian Approaches to Development Cooperation, or AADC. I want to start by expressing our thanks and appreciation to the KDI School of Public Policy and Management, represented by Dr. Wook Song, Associate Dean and Professor at the KDI School. KDI, the KDI School, and the Asia Foundation have been collaborating on AADC for a decade. This marks the 10th year of the dialogue and publication series, but the first time we have run it as a public webinar. Even though Asian development cooperation has a long history, the traditional aid donors knew little about it. So in 2010, KDI and the Asia Foundation formed a partnership and developed the AADC program in an effort to change that equation. When we started AADC, we were learning and sharing about the ABCs of Asian development cooperation. But as we know, over the past decade, Asian cooperation has grown tremendously in volume, reach, and complexity, and has changed the entire ecosystem of international development cooperation. And during the current pandemic, Asian resources from government aid agencies, the private sector, and NGOs have contributed enormously to COVID-19 response, recovery, and research. Since 2010, we've discussed a broad range of issues, including the basics of how Asian countries design and deliver their cooperation programs, to thematic topics, such as climate change adaptation and mitigation, the role of the private sector and NGOs, and last year's topic on the fourth industrial revolution and how this is affecting the future of work in Asia. This year, of course, we'll be looking at Asian development cooperation in and beyond a COVID world. Over the next three days, we want to both reflect and to look ahead. Among our objectives are, first, to examine the ways COVID-19 has impacted current and future Asian development partnerships. Second, to explore how the actions of Asian NGOs and private sector actors during COVID has increased opportunities to involve non-state actors in regional development efforts going forward. And third, to scrutinize Asian multilateralism, its impact during COVID and its future beyond. In this time of high international competition, we believe that platforms such as AADC 
are vital to broaden the potential and the opportunities for concrete international cooperation. We thank all of you for joining us today and hope you can join for all three sessions. In closing, let me again thank our longtime partners at the KDI School for their strong support and cooperation. And also extend my thanks to the Asia Foundation's Korea office, especially our country representative, Kwang Kim, and our program officer, Kyung Sun Lee, who worked so tirelessly to put this webinar together. I wish all of you a very fruitful three days of discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gordon, for your continued support to AADC. If some of you were watching the slideshow, the video at the beginning before we started the webinar, you would have seen Gordon's photo in many of the shots during that video. He has been a very long time supporter. Next, I'd like to turn to Wuxun, Associate Dean Professor, KDI School, to give his opening remarks. Good afternoon and good morning. Uh, Mr. Gordon Hine, uh, Senior Vice President of the Asia Foundation, and Kwang Kim uh, and Kyung Suk Lee of Korea Office, and Anthea Mulakala, the Senior Director of the Asia Foundation, and distinguished participants. Uh, it's a great uh, honor to welcome you uh, to the 2020 uh, AADC under the theme of uh, changing the landscape of development cooperation amidst and beyond the COVID-19 in Asia. Uh, on behalf of the KDA School of Public Policy and Management, uh, I want to thank the Asia Foundation for this wonderful uh, opportunity to be a part of uh, this meaningful uh, program. Uh, KDI and KDI School uh, have collaborated with the Asia Foundation uh, for over a decade on this uh, WADC uh, programs. And this partnership has helped us expand our knowledge sharing initiatives on Asian development cooperation and uh, South-South cooperation. Uh, in less than a decade, uh, development cooperation in Asia has grown in volume, uh, reach, and complexity, uh, transforming the entire uh, ecosystem of international development cooperation. Uh, with the COVID-19 outbreak, uh, this landscape has undoubtedly changed and demands more effective cross-border coordination and impactful uh, policy measures. Uh, given our uh, current uh, state of affairs, the value of uh, this uh, WADC 2020 program is even more uh, pronounced, and we are uh, very pleased to be a part of this program. Uh, even as I speak, uh, the, the enormous shock unleashed by the COVID-19 continues to threaten uh, public health care system, education, social security, and political stability around the world. Although it's uh, still too early to assess the realized loss and a coming recovery, we know the crisis will leave long lasting marks on the economy and uh, global governance. Uh, in the face of these challenges, I hope our discussion here will go beyond uh, the traditional aid agenda, uh, underscore the importance of a cooperative uh, knowledge sharing approach COVID-19 and uh, lay out a variety of mutual learning initiatives across the region. Uh, it is estimated uh, inequality being uh, one of the hardest blows of the pandemic. A recent UN Conference on Trade and Development report uh, predicts that the developing countries are expected to take more time uh, to recover than those of developed countries and emphasizes that uh, South South cooperation and solidarity are essential for developing countries' recovery. recovery. Uh, whereas the uh, global financial crisis gave rise to a trend of deglobalization, as uh, manifested in Brexit and the Trump presidency, uh, COVID 19 uh, is reshaping uh, global cooperation. So it is a stark reality that uh, no country can face the challenges of this pandemic alone. 
the pandemic is an opportunity to push for more global cooperation uh, in the areas of health and scientific knowledge sharing for human welfare. So it's my wish that this event will further reinforce the necessity for strategic partnership and a regional integration of Asia, setting forth a new outlook on development cooperation in the post-pandemic era. You know, the Korea's successful uh, containment of a pandemic while upholding uh, democratic values and maintaining transparency in the process has now added another volume of experience we can share with the world. So KDR School will continue to work towards enhancing its scope and reach of knowledge sharing through cooperation with the prestigious institutes like the Asia Foundation and through education and short-term trainings that we are committed to conducting. Okay, I'm looking forward to today's uh, and three day, actually three day dialogue on uh, the changing landscapes of uh, developing cooperation to learn more about the recipient countries' demands in the current crisis, the growing roles of NGOs and Asia's multilateral action towards mitigating the crippling uh, consequences while yielding more inclusive uh, global governance. So let me express again my uh, deep gratitude to the Asia Foundation for their effort and partnership in organizing uh, this AADC program. I would also like to convey my appreciation to all the speakers and participants uh, near and far uh, who will make this event productive and, and meaningful. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Son, for your partnership over many years that we've had with KDI School and KDI. Finally, I invite Kwang Kim, Asia Foundation's country representative in Korea, to address you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. On behalf of the Asia Foundation Korea office, I thank you all for joining us this virtual Asian Approaches to Development Cooperation webinar series. I especially thank Associate Dean uh, Wook Son and the KDI School of Public Policy Management for a long-standing partnership and relationship. This year, the topic of changing landscape of development cooperation amidst and beyond COVID-19 in Asia is incredibly important and very timely. Across Asia, like other parts of the world, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant implication for public, for public policy. But health, safety, and economic security, governance, and political stability. Many are looking to Asia for leadership, many in the world. But as we all know, Asia is not uniform with a large variety of experiences. This AADC, 2020 aims to bolster us Asia's overall preparedness for future pandemic by sharing the knowledge and responses of COVID-19 across the region and beyond. The Asia Foundation and the KDI School has been supporting cross-country and regional dialogues through Asia, enabling governments and non-government leaders to share lessons and best practices related to governance and common development issues. This year, we are very privileged to gather some of the best people in Asia from public, private, philanthropic, and academic organizations to share ideas and creative solutions. Today's webinar features Bangladesh, Korea, and China cases. By sharing experiences and lessons and combining collective experience and wisdom, I hope we all could improve our readiness and preparation, preparedness for future crises and responses. Wishing you all the best and looking forward to the rest of the, uh, the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kwan, for your continued support for the AED series. We will now expertly segue to session one to discuss the new demands and dynamics of official development and assistance or South-South cooperation on Asian developing countries in COVID-19. The global pandemic, 
pandemic not only threatens public health and safety, but presents social, political, and economic challenges with, with restrictions on mobility and civic commercial activity. For developing countries with large populations, few resources, and existing uh, public health crises and multifaceted development ch challenges, managing and recovering from this crisis has been tough and will continue to be tough. There are increasing demands for international development cooperation to assist in addressing the short and long-term effects caused by COVID-19 on developing economies. So in our first session today, we will discuss Asian recipient partners challenges and growing demands for aid and investment to respond to the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 and we'll be featuring Bangladesh. The session will assess these needs against the current and future official development assistance and South-South cooperation from partners. We'll be featuring Korea and China, as Kwan mentioned. We hope this session will provide better understanding of Asian recipient countries' policy responses and development plans and help providers to effectively adjust their strategies and programs. Kyung Sun has put a message in the chat. I think that uh, please post your questions in the chat box or Q&A box. We will be collecting them uh, for um, discussion during the Q&A period. Speakers, I will remind you when you have approximately two minutes left. So our first speaker is Ms. Sultana Afroz, Secretary to the Government of Bangladesh and CEO of the Public-Private Partnership Authority. Secretary Afroz has a distinguished career with the Bangladesh Civil Service, both in Bangladesh across num numerous ministries including as additional secretary and chief of the United Nations wing at the Ministry of Finance, and also abroad as a diplomat and representative to several UN agencies. She was a core group member of the government of Bangladesh's private sector development project. Ms. Afroz, I invite you to give your address. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this very important session. Uh, a representative from Asian uh, uh, Foundation, Asia Foundation, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you uh, in this first session of 2020 AADC webinar uh, titled Changing Landscape of Development Cooperation Amidst and Beyond COVID-19 in Asia. It is a great privilege for me to give you an overview of growing demand of infrastructure investment in Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh economy is getting stronger under the able leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, through her remarkable initiatives in mobilizing the Bangladesh economy, the public-private partnership landscape in Bangladesh has been transformed. She has emphasized on the infrastructure development of Bangladesh through public-private uh, partnership across the sectors. This is our prime minister who has really given emphasis on this public-private partnership. As we all know, the COVID-19 outbreak has significantly impacted infrastructure development and the global economy. It has emerged as the black swan event of the century with significant macroeconomic impact, both globally and in Bangladesh. The rapid spread of COVID-19 has led to a significant fall in major indices, indicating its impact and potential to significantly affected GDP growth. The pandemic has led to a significant reduction in demand from SMEs corporate structural shifts in customer behavior and transformation of employee roles and overall operating model. Secretary Afroz, can we stop for a minute so we can put up your slides? I know you've spent time preparing a presentation and maybe we can have your assistant just uh, tinker with the technical part. But I, it, it, uh, it's already on. Can you? We well, we're not seeing the slides actually. We're just seeing a blank, uh, black screen. Oh, I'm so sorry for that. I'm so no sorry. No problem. We were listening to you intently. Let's just see if we can get the slides back up. <laughs> uh, 
I think it needs to happen from your end. Yes, I think so. Just can you give us a minute? I'm sure. so sorry. I thought you were seeing my slides. I didn't know. Not yet. Okay, just give us a minute. Okay, we're also trying from our end to see if we can share them for you. Please, please. We welcome you to continue, however, if you'd like to keep going, I'm sure we are, we'll happily look at you. <laughs> we have given share, but I don't know. Um, we have the slides now. Can you can you see this now? Yes, I can see Sheikh Hasina. Oh, great. great. Okay, so I can start from there again. Um, you know, Bangladesh economy is getting stronger under the able leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Through her remarkable initiative in mobilizing the Bangladesh economy, the public-private partnership landscape in Bangladesh has been transformed. She has emphasized on the infrastructure development of Bangladesh through public-private partnership across the sector. As we all know, the COVID-19 outbreak has significantly impacted infrastructure development and the global economy. Sorry again, can you, is it going the next slide? Yes. Okay, can I say now? Okay, so as we all know that COVID-19 outbreak has significantly impacted infrastructure development and the global economy. It has emerged as the black swan event of the century with significant macroeconomic impact both globally and in Bangladesh. The rapid spread of COVID-19 has led to a significant fall in major indices, indicating its impact and potential to significantly affect GDP growth. The pandemic has led to a significant reduction in demand from SMEs, corporate structural shifts in customer behavior and transformation of employee roles and overall operating model. Liquidity problem in the financial sector has slowed down. The implementation of ongoing projects and delays in the tendering process and regular approval process of the project among the sectors. However, Bangladesh government with the able leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has taken a strong measures and initiatives to confront this challenge to turn this into opportunity. According to the seventh fiber plan, Bangladesh requires GDP's 6% or nearly 15 billion investment in physical infrastructure and service sector a year to achieve the development goals set in Vision 2021 and Vision 2041. Out of this required investment, the share of PPP has been estimated at GDP's 1.8% or 4.5 billion a year, which is 30% of total investment in infrastructure and service sector. To meet this rising infrastructure investment demand, the government has already directed the ministries and divisions to implement 30% of their investment projects under public-private partnership. Till date, Bangladesh has built a project pipeline of more than 28 billion to uh, realize the government's vision of bringing about a transformational change to its infrastructure and service sector out of 78 projects. PPP contracts have already been signed for 17 projects 
15 projects are under procurement stage and detailed feasibility study is ongoing for 27 projects. You know, we have a dialysis center at the National Institute of Kidney Disease under urology and college and hospitals are the first successfully implemented PPP project in the health sector. Besides construction activities of elevated expressway in important strategic location, affordable housing projects for low and middle income group of people, JTs of Mongla Port and three blocks of Bongobondu High Tech City are ongoing and expected to be implemented within the stipulated time frame. Okay, can you see these slides now? Okay, so, yes, we can. okay. so we all know that infrastructural investment is essential for the long-term economic development of any country. And public-private partnership is a great tool of such infrastructure development. The government of Bangladesh have always received tremendous support from its international counterparts and development partners to help Bangladesh during this crisis. You know that IMF has approved emergency loans totaling of 732 million uh, US dollar. Overall, the Bangladesh government had achieved record foreign aid disbursement from development partners aimed uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Multilateral agencies and development partners have always provided sufficient support towards the development and implementation of the PPP projects in Bangladesh. We have been receiving continuous support in the areas of capacity building, transaction advisory, sterilization of documents, and policy formulation. Even during this pandemic, we have organized and uh, partnered several virtual conferences, webinars, and physical meeting with the World Bank Group, Asian Development Bank, the Commercial Law Development Program under US Department of Commerce, United Nations Population Fund, UN Volunteers, and with our G2G partner countries, namely Japan, Singapore, uh, Denmark, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia, and other countries also. I think I'm very sorry for the uh, slides. Now you can see the slides, what I just mentioned. Maybe you go to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the COVID-19 outbreak has significantly impacted infrastructure development all over the world, including Bangladesh. Some of the long-term challenges that are being faced by Bangladesh are high levels of debt and low cash reserves followed by a liquidity crisis, supply chain interruptions affecting the availability of parts and equipment for the infrastructure projects, potential trigger towards insurance settlement, downward spiral in demand and use of major infrastructure assets like transportation, risk of exchange rate fluctuations and potential trigger of forced measures clauses. With the strong leadership of our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, we are very determined to overcome these challenges. I'm sorry for the slides again, but I'm sure you, you can listen to me and I'm just uh, uh, explaining that uh, we are very much determined to overcome these challenges. However, any support from the development partners will not only expedite this process, but also shall create economic benefits and better access to adjoining countries and their trade links. Here, I would like to mention, PBP Authority welcomes any kind of advisory support, technical assistance, capacity building, and private investment towards developing a robust economy through infrastructure development. Over the uh, last few years, the PPP landscape in Bangladesh has been transformed. The reforms and initiatives introduced have led to the establishment of one of the largest PPP projects pipeline in emerging markets. We expect this momentum 
to continue and lead to the development of much needed public infrastructure services in Bangladesh. Uh, PPP is future, Bangladesh is growing and be part of it. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry for the slides you couldn't see properly. We have some technological problem and we always accept these technological hazards. I'm very sorry, but we all, uh, you know, from a uh, public private partnership authority, we thank you very much for uh, your patience hearing. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Secretary of Rose. We thoroughly enjoyed your comments and the technical difficulties were minor. And I'm sure the, the points you made will resonate. The challenges that Bangladesh has faced will resonate with many other countries. And thank you for underscoring the importance of, of multi-stakeholder partnerships to assist this recovery. We can see from your work that uh, Bangladesh is on a solid path. Next, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Hokju Kwan, President of Korea Association of International Development and Cooperation, KAIDEC, which is a leading research institution on international development. Dr. Kwan is also a professor at the Graduate School of Public Administration at Seoul National University. He is also a member of the Committee for International Development Cooperation, the top governmental policy instrument under the Prime Minister's office that decides on Korea's major official development assistance policy. He has also served on numerous international and multilateral policy bodies. Dr. Kwan. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to present on the Korea's international uh, development cooperation in response to uh, COVID-19. And I will uh, share my uh, presentation. First, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Maybe you could just okay. um, screen or um, what do you call it? Um, screen mode, because we see the, the margins as well. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, so, uh, I mean, this presentation is uh, given by me as a uh, academic. I don't represent uh, uh, Korean government's policy. That is the uh, caveat. Uh, so this is my own uh, presentation, nothing uh, related to Korean government. So when we start to discuss about uh, COVID-19 and international development, I think we need to start about the global context. Uh, but I think uh, all of you are well aware of this global situation. So I don't like to go in detail, but I just like to point out a few things. The first thing is that we see uh, different countries show different capability to respond to uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And also, I think it was very surprising that many of uh, developed countries were uh, unable to respond very effectively, while some countries like uh, South Korea and Germany and some other countries like Thailand uh, responded very well. That is, I think, one point. And the second is that uh, we are expecting huge increase in poverty. I think we will lose some of the gain we made through MDG. So probably uh, we will lose uh, half of the poverty gains. Uh, so that is really a difficult challenge for us in the future. The, the last thing I'd like to point out is that we are going to see uh, global recessions. So that poses an important, difficult challenge for uh, developing countries as well as uh, industrialized economies. The first, I'd like to come back to Korea case. And Korea, uh, at the beginning of the epidemic, uh, it was the hardest country. But soon after that, Korea showed that uh, resilience and uh, it has a best practice to to uh, contain the virus. 
So uh, how how Korea do that? The first, I think, uh, this test and track uh, treatment and containment policy it was very effective. But I think uh, we need to also point out about the national uh, crisis management system was in place. Uh, so it, it is not just immediate response, but the governments was able to coordinate different level of governments and different of actors uh, to, to uh, contain the virus. But most fundamentally, I, I think uh, Korea has a, a national health insurance uh, system. It has a universal coverage and the Korea was able to mobilize a resource through national health insurance. We mobilized the doctors and nurse and the quarantine workers and importantly test laboratories. So when you say test and track treatment, it is not just a test on the site, but you need to have a laboratories to confirm whether this is a virus or not. So that is also Korea has a ability and the resource. So that is a kind of underlying basis for the Korean response. So with this uh, kind of response, Korea did not really lock down uh, measures, but we are able to maintain the physical distance while we maintaining social and economic activities. So I think after uh, event, the economic and social impact of the COVID-19 in Korea was, was uh, smaller than other countries. So with this kind of Korean experience, I think the Korean governments, especially in terms of international cooperation, the Korean governments provide uh, support to other developing countries. So we can set three different levels. First, the Korean governments provide immediate humanitarian support to developing countries. So when we have first outbreak of COVID-19 uh, pandemic, then uh, in the middle term, now we are moving into this mid-term uh, plan. Uh, so a season for public health care in developing countries so that countries can have a resilience. The second is that uh, more long-term uh, uh, economic resilience, that is the, uh, the uh, future strategy. But I also like to come back to uh, other developing countries in uh, East Asia. Uh, so East Asian countries are also react to the, uh, the crisis with a very decisive response, but, but I think uh, it was not really adequate mainly because it's a weak capacity in terms of test and track treatment. But still the, the East Asian countries were able to contain the virus compared to other regions. But more important point is that uh, in the future, uh, we need to uh, go through this difficult time, but it is more like economic challenges. So, uh, in many developing countries, the uh, formal workers work in the, uh, the, the companies in the global product chain. They will find the situation is very difficult. But I think uh, informal workers find it more uh, difficult uh, because they are in a very, very precarious situation. But also uh, international migrant workers, the many of migrant workers coming back home lose their job in host countries. But these are the vital source of foreign exchange. So how we uh, bring back these international migrant workers is very, very critical challenge for the future. But uh, in terms of social protection uh, in the COVID crisis, some of the Asian developing country really responded well. Uh, I like to give you some examples. So the Philippines and Indonesia implemented a cash transfer program so that they, uh, they provide this uh, crisis support to the poor. So they, the poor household managed to, to survive this difficult time. Uh, but it's not only Philippines and Indonesia, we have a uh, examples of the Mongolia and also uh, Vietnam. 
but of course we have some uh, issues like uh, whether we just provide a transfer without condition or we should give it as a conditional transfer. But I like to point out that uh, how, why Philippines and Indonesia were able to respond. Uh, we, we need to come back to 2008 crisis. Uh, when we have a global economic crisis, the Philippines and Indonesia bring the system into, into uh, uh, action. So they were able to use this system in the COVID-19 crisis. So uh, before I like to uh, uh, discuss about the future response, I, I, I like to show this analytical map of social protection. We just uh, say about the social protection response to COVID-19, but we need to analytically see what's the difference between uh, among these social protection measures, some measures more uh, immediate provisional measure and some measures are more institutional, some more social security and some more social investment. So these are the four different uh, categories of the social protection. But when we have a crisis, it, we have no option. We need to immediate crisis response. But the, my point is that how about the next uh, challenge? How about the future crisis? So then we need to more institutional approach. The Philippine and Indonesian case and also Korean case show that how this country react to this COVID-19 crisis with active measures because they have institutions in place. So that once we overcome this immediate COVID endemic, then I think we need to think about the institution building for health, institution building for poverty reductions. That is the way I think we need to think about uh, beyond COVID-19 international development. But, but I think uh, not only social protection, but the future economic recovery is very important. So uh, if we, how we go about the future, then I think first, uh, of course, is a prevention of further in, in infection, but we need to support uh, migrant workers from developing countries. Uh, we need to bring back to, to their old work and then they can send back the uh, remittance to the, their home country. So we have a vital economic uh, activities going on. And the, inside the developing countries, we. We should support the, the governments can have a public work project so that the poor families can engage the economic work. Uh, and the overall in the global economy, we should, uh, we should uh, pursue re-establishing global production chain so that we can come back our economic interactions. We can recover global economy back after the uh, coronavirus. But how about uh, the Korean uh, policy? I think the Korean uh, uh, Foreign Aid International Development Corporation did very well during the time of the COVID-19. Uh, so, but I think we should continue. Uh, but my suggestion to Korean government is that uh, for the future, not only about the COVID-19, but as a donor country, uh, the Korea needs to upgrade our uh, policy framework. The first from labor intensive to capital intensive development corporations. One minute the left. Second is from know-how to deep knowledge based uh, cooperation. So that is the uh, knowledge based, but more deep knowledge based. The third is uh, more result orient ODA, but also the Korea needs a more clear vision and the policy objective for the future. Well, uh, I think because of time constraint, I, I give you a little bit fast, but I hope that this is uh, useful for you and I will uh, stop uh, my presentation here. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Kwan, for your call to action. Excellent recommendations, both on a macro level and as well as addressing specific needs of particularly groups. Indeed, COVID has revealed that cracks in the social protection infrastructure in the region, with many falling through these cracks, the urgency for enhanced and institutionalized social protection is real and an area which needs international support. Finally, today we welcome Ms. Wang Chen, who is an Assistant Research Fellow at the Institute of International Development Cooperation with the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation, KITEC, a Ministry of Commerce affiliated think tank. Ms. Wang has considerable experience on Chinese development cooperation, including China's foreign aid reform, and comparative analysis of foreign aid systems and mechanisms. She also specializes in global health policy research and health aid strategy and innovation. Ms. Wang. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Asia Foundation for inviting me to join this esteemed panel. Um, I will look at today's issue through, um, from China's development assistance point of view. And let me share my PPT first. Is it, is it on the screen? Yes. It is. Good. So I will first give a bit of background information on China's ODA. Uh, then I will introduce our development cooperation approach during the COVID pandemic, some challenges that maybe all development cooperation providers may run into, and then some personal suggestions. So China's ODA is characterized as South-South cooperation. There are several principles that we adhere to. First is non-interference of internal affairs. Um, China never uses foreign aid as means to force change on political system or national policy, be it in normal times or emergency situation. And second, related to it, China respects the own will, choice, and ability uh, of the partner countries. And that is reflected in the way we discuss and decide the development cooperation projects, which is based on mutuality and equality. And third, as a South-South cooperation provider, China is still a developing country. So while we strive for the best, we need to consider our own ability and focus on utilizing our limited resources in the most effective and efficient way. Uh, in terms of the scale, the latest figure is yet to be released, uh, hopefully next year, but the average annual amount appropriated earlier was about 30 billion RMB, uh, which was around uh, four to five billion US dollars per year. Uh, and it should not have changed dramatically, I believe. Um, there are three types of uh, foreign aid financing, grant, interest-free loan, and concessional loan. Grant takes the biggest proportion right now, possibly around 50% is grant. And financing types other than these three are not considered uh, foreign aid financing for ODA financing at the moment uh, in China. In terms of project instruments, I think it is more or less similar to other development cooperation providers. Uh, I just want to point out one that might be different, which is we dispatch long-term medical teams overseas. Uh, China probably is the only government that organizes and dispatches large scale uh, long-term medical teams through ODA channel to other developing countries. By 2019, China has dispatched 27,000 long-term medical team members, treating over 3 billion patient times. In 2018, for example, there are about 1,040 uh, medical team members in 53 countries. And these medical teams played an important role during this pandemic, which I will talk about later. Uh, in terms of the sector distribution, the biggest share goes to economic infrastructure, but social infrastructure also takes a big share, including agriculture, health, and climate change. In terms of geographic distribution for projects other than human resources development cooperation right now, over 100 countries receive China's foreign aid. They are mostly concentrated in Asia and Africa. Uh, and uh, according to statistics by 2011, two thirds of China's foreign aid budget goes to the least developed countries and low income countries. 
So the COVID-19 pandemic is a test to China's development cooperation. It is not the first time China uh, responds to a public health emergency of international concern on a large scale. Actually, China's response to the Ebola epidemic in West Africa in uh, 2014 and 2015 uh, was the largest health and humanitarian response China had ever delivered by then totaling uh, 750 million RMB. Uh, but this time around with the scale and all out impact of the pandemic and with the fact that at, at least at the beginning, China's domestic fight uh, against the disease was also very intensive. Um, all kinds of medical resources were extremely strained. Uh, it brought new and more challenging difficulties, uh, but we still tried our best to provide assistance we took the following approach. First, we dispatched emergency public health and medical expert teams to other countries. By September the 8th, China had sent 34 medical and public health expert teams uh, to 32 countries. Most of these experts had fresh first-hand experience treating patients with COVID or conducting public health control interventions against COVID in China and in Wuhan particularly. Um, because as you may know, more than 40,000 medical doctors and public health experts from 19 provinces rushed to Hubei, where Wuhan was located, to provide help. So our doctors and disease control experts accumulated a lot of experience. And when you are encountering with a new disease, this type of experience is crucial, especially in a fast evolving situation. Um, so they shared latest knowledge on how to treat patients, uh, ways that worked here in China. Uh, they also assisted with the disease control strategy, advised on how to do contact tracing, how to allocate resources, how to repurpose facilities for treatment and quarantine, etc. And these teams also pro brought with them um, PPEs, testing kits, drugs, uh, and other medical products as needed. And some of them stayed much longer there than planned as required by the local authorities. Se second, China mobilized the long-term medical teams I mentioned before, who were already staying uh, in the partner countries to support local efforts. Uh, right now, we have medical teams in more than 50 developing countries. They continued with their regular work during the pandemic, and they organized hundreds of online and offline counseling sessions. Um, they also assisted with the virtual exchanges between Chinese hospitals and local hospitals. Third, um, so far, China had donated PPEs, diagnostics, and uh, other me medical products in response to the pandemic to 150 countries and four international organizations. And uh, I have to say, transportation was a huge challenge, um, but China really took all means to run against time. Uh, we worked with WFP to run through the late uh, the last mile to, to deliver some of the medical equipment to, uh, to African countries. Uh, when flights don't work to the neighboring countries, we use the cars and trains. Uh, as far as I know, some donations uh, took only five days from partner country request uh, to delivery on site, including all the procedures of product procurement, flight coordination, uh, customs clearance in between. Um, fourth, China expedited the transfer of hospitals in developing countries that were already in construction so that these uh, facilities could be utilized against uh, the con uh, for the control of COVID. Uh, China also, when very necessary, um, helped with the fast construction or conversion of health facilities for disease control purposes. And fifth, um, China attached great importance to the knowledge and uh, information sharing. I think at the beginning, our science really worked this time. I think um, we isolated the genome sequence and identified it as novel coronavirus really uh, quickly uh, and released that information immediately. We accumulated some knowledge, some lessons that are crucial to running against time and running against the virus. So uh, China held hundreds of virtual exchanges through multilateral platforms and uh, uh, through bilateral channels to share our experience. 
uh, we built uh, open database and platforms for all to access. And it's not just, I want to emphasize, it's not just the knowledge, but also the message that every country should take this seriously and to do the contact tracing right as early as possible and to mobilize your population as early as possible. Uh, Wuhan was, the was first um, seriously hit and we did not know what were we were dealing with. So uh, it is spiraled into that state where you, you had to concentrate a lot of resources into Wuhan to bring it down. But other provinces in China did not need to go through that because other provinces saw what happened in Wuhan and did the contact tracing right and stopped the transmission chain in time. So apart from the knowledge, that was the message we wanted to deliver. And some countries took it seriously. Um, actually, a lot of Asian countries and African countries took it seriously. So we do see a better situation in these areas. And sixth, China tries uh, its best to support multilateral cooperation and global solidarity. This, I have to say, is a firm policy by the Chinese government. First, uh, China provides financial assistance to multilateral organizations. For example, China has pledged 50 million US dollars and 20 million US dollars to WHO and Gavi, respectively. Um, China, yeah, yeah. And China is also providing assistance in collaboration uh, with multilateral organizations. Uh, as I have mentioned, we worked with WFP to provide, to deliver uh, life-saving goods to uh, African countries. And I believe our government is also in discussion with UNICEF uh, in terms of how to deliver other life-saving goods, including vaccines. And third, uh, China cooperated with the organizations to share knowledge and experience. And fourth uh, is to support multilateral mechanisms such as COVAX to develop, produce, and equitably uh, distribute health products. And fifth, uh, China is helping uh, the UN to set up humanitarian response hub in China. And sixth, China is uh, carrying out, uh, is to, will carry out debt service suspension uh, through multilateral platforms such as G20. And lastly, China will support, uh, Africa is supporting and will continue to support Africa CDC uh, through technical cooperation and materials donation in their fight against the virus on the continent. All these efforts come with challenges and these challenges may be universal to all development cooperation providers. From the demand side, as has been mentioned uh, by other presenters, we could see that the shock to the healthcare system will have ripple effects. The global population of extreme poverty has increased by 7% and immunization coverage has dropped from 84% to 70%, which set us back by 25 years, I believe. And progress to reach targets of climate change, of gender equality, uh, of education and other international development goals uh, of SDG is also reversed or slowed down. So how do we deal with that? And at the same time, we still face logistics difficulties. Although transportations are gradually um, getting better, uh, not all projects and exchanges are back on track. We could also see the possibility of development finance going down from many countries. And we also face the risk of the momentum to sustain interest uh, to health issues waning down uh, with time going by, but we are still not prepared for the next outbreak. So going forward, I think we need to think bolder. We need to adjust our approach uh, to change of situations. We particularly need to work together uh, with solidarity and to better utilize each agency's strengths, especially uh, given the fact that resources are very limited. And for each bilateral development agencies, I suggest we need to put health at the center of our agenda. And finally, um, this pandemic has shown that no matter what development stage uh, you are in, it does not guarantee less um, saddening results out of this outbreak. So the global South, many Asian countries included, have good models and solutions to offer. Um, so I hope to see more involvement from the global South as providers of ideas and solutions. Thank you, Chair, back to you. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Wong, for providing details on China's extensive response, how knowledge sharing domestically and internationally was effective for China, and as well as on the challenges we face going forward to support multilateral approaches and ensure health security remains a policy priority. Thanks to all our speakers. That was an excellent, excellent launch to our discussion session. I see that we have questions coming in already. So I will start the questioning off. We have a few questions that we already had lined up for you and then we have some others. So let me just see where I'd like to start with these. Actually, since you just ended, um, panelist Wang, I'll start with you. So tomorrow we will hear more from Haoming Huang who is Vice President, China Global Philanthropy Institute. And he'll be talking about the role that Chinese CSOs have played in COVID-19 response in the region. From your perspective, how has the pandemic strengthened China's partnership with civil society organizations in its South-South cooperation? Oh, thank you. That's a very good question. I think Mr. Huang will have a better view on this. Um, from my limited observation, I think, um, this is actually an area where we need to strengthen. Um, our government encouraged and assisted uh, with the contact between our NGOs and foundations uh, and the recipient countries and assisted with the del delivery of life-saving goods from the civil society. I believe our embassies overseas also played a big role, but I think uh, overall, our government's collaboration with CSOs uh, is the effort to further explore their potential need to be um, strengthened, uh, especially with the research institutions and the philanthropic uh, sector. The Chinese science, as I mentioned, scored a major win in the early days of the outbreak, uh, and uh, it really laid a foundation for many of the following uh, innovations, and the response was also reflected uh, also reflected the growth uh, and the maturing in China's philanthropic sector over recent years with the rise of uh, you know, corporate and individual foundations that were able to channel a great amount of resources in targeted and professional way. Uh, but I don't think these two areas have been fully explored. So I look forward to what unfolds later and I also look forward to what Ms. Huang has to uh, you know, input into this, uh, the future session. Thank you. I'm going to turn to some of the audience questions now. Um, there's a question for uh, Secretary Afros. Would it be possible for you to give us a concrete example of how public-private partnership works to increase or improve infrastructure investment in Bangladesh? Is there a specific effort or plan targeting the Rohingya refugees in the country? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, thank you very much. You know, our Honorable Prime Minister uh, became the, uh, you know, uh, very active when the Rohingyas, you know, started coming uh, to Bangladesh and she really tried to give the shelter and, uh, you know, uh, she was named as a mother of humanity. So there is a, a real challenge for Bangladesh, but uh, the government has really given a great effort to get these uh, Rohingyas, uh, you know, to be uh, in our country. But we always want them to go back their motherland with dignity. But in this um, challenging time, government has really tried to uh, support them, uh, you know, while they are in our country in Bangladesh. You know that uh, PPP is, uh, you know, uh, this authority is under the prime minister's office. And, uh, you know, we are uh, working to bring the investment, uh, uh, you know, locally and, of course, uh, uh, you know, from abroad. So uh, PPP, actually, we have different projects and programs, uh, you know, we are receiving from our uh, ministries and divisions, but we have also, you know, unsolicited uh, projects also uh, coming in. But, uh, you know, we have our uh, foreign ministry and we have our social welfare in, in ministry. They have really a program 
uh, you know, uh, you know, for these Rohingyas. But uh, whenever we have uh, any program or projects received like that, uh, you know, we we are ready to support them. But at present, we do not have any project directly for the, uh, you know, these uh, Rohingya peoples. But in every project we have. We, we are uh, really uh, supporting or uh, taking uh, the uh, actions. So our forcibly displaced people get support from the project. But at this uh, moment, we do not have any concrete project to support these Rohingyas, uh, but uh, it's a good uh, questions. We will remember, uh, you know, and uh, we will move forward. If we get any kind of assistance and support, uh, from our development partners or invest investors, uh, you know, to uh, get this kind of project to support Rohingyas, we will do that. But thank you very much, yes. Thank you for the answer. We have some really great questions coming in from the audience. So I'm going to direct this one to Professor Kwan first, but others may want to answer. With only a few donors of foreign assistance, providers of foreign assistance uh, within Asia, do you see a possibility of cooperation and or coordination amongst donors, specifically in the Asia region? This is particularly relevant given the backdrop this past year of intensely contested uh, geopolitical tensions in the region and very nationalistic and protectionist tendencies. How would you respond to that question? But I think uh, it's uh, desirable uh, to have international collaboration and uh, cooperation among uh, East Asian uh, countries like uh, uh, Japan, Korea, and China. Maybe China is not yet a uh, DAC member, uh, but uh, uh, you see the relation among these countries uh, apart, uh, I mean, not only about international development cooperation, but other matters are still is bumpy and uh, tricky. So uh, unfortunately, it's, it's not really uh, realistic to see uh, close collaboration uh, among these countries. But I think we should uh, work hard. And uh, uh, as a president of KAIDEC, Korean International uh, Association of International Development Cooperation. We work closely with our colleague uh, in Japan and China, but these are more like uh, academic and uh, practitioner, but we, we, we need to see more collaboration at the government level. Uh, so there is a, a, a situation, uh, I mean, it's not desirable, but uh, that is a fact of life. Thank you. Does anyone else want to jump in on that? I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I agree. I think especially in, in times of a strained uh, uh, relations, we need to find more ways to collaborate. Uh, especially if we could start from the civil society, we could start from the research institutions, we start there and gradually, you know, moving forward, you find one point where we, you, you could find more ways to collaborate and then you, you know, you expand that collaboration. That is always mm. the philosophy our, of our institute. Mm. Great. Another question, which is also to all panelists, uh, maybe I'll ask Ms. Uh, Secretary Afros to take this one first. To what extent is South, South to South development cooperation more instrumental in compared to, as compared to traditional development schemes in supporting COVID-19 mitigation efforts in developing countries? What's been your experience in Bangladesh? Uh, uh, thank you very much. But could you please repeat the question again? Because uh, what you said that, uh, you know, this, uh, you mentioned about the South-South cooperation? Yes. So to what extent has South-South cooperation perhaps been more effective or instrumental than traditional aid uh, in supporting Bangladesh's COVID-19 mitigation efforts? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. It's a very good question and really you're helping us to, uh, you know, enlighten our thinking uh, because the last question what you have said about the Rohingyas, I was really thinking that maybe this would be our next target uh, to think about our project on Rohingyas. 
So uh, the second one you talked about the South South uh, cooperation. Of course, it. I believe that this is very very important for Bangladesh. I know that we receive support from you know uh, 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 you know international organizations or other developed countries, but you know the knowledge we have amongst ourselves. Uh, it is very very important. The the region, uh, uh, the South South. You know the countries we have already. Uh, some, uh, you know, cooperation strategies, and uh, we share knowledge, we share, you know, many things uh, amongst ourselves. So I strongly believe that the South-South cooperation can also definitely contribute in this uh, pandemic situation to get support from these countries, and we can definitely share our ideas among the South-South countries. So I think um, it is very, very important uh, to uh, get South-South cooperation uh, to support this, uh, you know, support this pandemic situation. Thanks. Uh, another question I have for Ms. Wang. Um, with regard to the logistics and resource constraints that you mentioned, to what extent is the Belt and Road Initiative a platform that has been, has been, or could be utilized for COVID-related assistance from China? Mm. Um, that's a good question. Um, so uh, I believe in uh, June, uh, a summit, a high-level summit of Babylon Road was held uh, so that uh, 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 around 25, I think 25 countries, uh, health ministers, uh, WHO, uh, DG, and uh, uh, DG of UNDP all attended. And uh, um, we had a um, uh, initi we had initiatives released uh, through those uh, conferences uh, through that conference uh, in terms of supporting the green economies in terms of supporting the fight against COVID nineteen uh, in terms of supporting the uh, uh, reaffirming our commitments as uh, I mentioned earlier um, I think the Belt and Road Initiative has. Uh, during the past few years, established some very good uh, mechanisms, for example, uh, that were utilized during this pandemic, for example, the mechanism of uh, research institutions. I don't remember exactly the name, but our science academy were involved and they established platforms to share data uh, with other research institutions along the Belt and Road. I think those were those mechanisms were used very efficiently and effectively during the pandemic. Dr. Kwan, there's a couple of specific questions about some points that you raised in your presentation. There's one that asks if you could elaborate a little bit more on what is labor intensive and capital intensive cooperation and what is the reasoning behind that? Uh, well, I think uh, the Korea is uh, 10 years past uh, as a OECD DAG members. So I think uh, it, no longer emerging donor. And, uh, but still uh, we, we haven't yet delivered our promise. When we joined the OECD DAC, we promised 0.25% uh, of GNI, but still is far behind. But I think uh, the reason is that it's not just to increase the money, but it is increase our capability to deliver more aid, more ODA effectively. So uh, then uh, I think uh, it, uh, the, the way we deliver our ODA is uh, uh, labor intensive. It involves a lot of personnel uh, with a relatively smaller size of ODA. And my suggestion is that with more larger amount of uh, larger size of ODA with less uh, personnel involved, but also it's not only same style of ODA uh, with a, a large size, but I think we need to change like a more program-based or also we need to uh, have a, a budget support and also we need to more multilateral uh, uh, collaboration. So my point is that we need to increase the size of ODA, but we, we don't need to number of personnel involved. 
So it's more like a capital intensive. So I mentioned about uh, uh, knowledge, uh, it's a know-how to deep knowledge, is a know-how is about our, our experience, Korean knowledge sharing, but we need more deep knowledge, our partners, not about the Korea, but about uh, our partner countries, what they need, and we need a, a larger size of ODA, different style of delivery, like a budget support or program, but then you need to have a much better capability. So I think Korea also needs to increase our capability to deliver better ODA to, to, to be an effective donors. I think uh, we need to think that because we are not no longer emerging donors. We are responsible member of, of the ODA. Yeah, again, I would say that's a very strong kind of call to action from your part. Uh, knowledge sharing has been kind of the cornerstone or the hallmark of Korean, Korean development assistance for a very long time. And uh, yes, maybe time to reflect and move ahead in the directions that you that you suggested. Thank you. Uh, more questions. We still have time. So another one from Ms. Wang. President Xi's commitment to sharing vaccines is very encouraging. Can you share how this will happen, given that China has a big population that itself needs to be vaccinated? Um, and the person also points out that it was really great that China had joined the COVAX initiative. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, I've been thinking about it a lot myself. <laughs> Actually, the delivery of uh, an equitable uh, distribution of uh, vaccines is both political and technical. It's highly technical. You need to ensure a lot of the, um, uh, you know, uh, spots in the chains are lined up. Uh, for example, we know that the delivery of, of mRNA vaccine needs. Uh, below zero uh, 70 uh, degrees Celsius kind of uh, uh, environment for it to be delivered and refrigerated. <laughs> so uh, these are all challenges uh, we need to consider. Um, I think right now, you know, and also this is tricky because uh, as a government, you couldn't force the private sector to do this and that. You also need to utilize the market uh, as a tool. So right now from my uh, limited observation, my, my perspective, I could see that our government first is encouraging our companies to apply for PQ or uh, EUR, the emergency use listing of WHO, to adhere to international standards. Uh, and uh, our, um, uh, it's not not called CFDA anymore, the authority in charge of the uh, regulations of, uh, uh, of vaccines in China uh, is also sharing with WHO, I believe, uh, technical documents uh, as required to expedite uh, the process of uh, applying for PQ and EU, uh, EUL. So a uh, regulation on the quality is the first thing the government could do. Uh, uh, and once gaining uh, the approval of international organizations, you know, for the private sectors to be involved in the co either COVAX or other purchasing channels, global purchasing channels would be much smoother. And, and second, uh, I think our government is uh, advising our companies to reasonably price uh, the vaccines and also to introduce competitions from outside our country so that the price could be brought down. Uh, that's my limited observation. And, uh, uh, and also third, in terms of, yes, we do have a large population, but right now we don't have an epidemic other than sporadic uh, endemics. Uh, we don't have a large spread epidemic within China. So the uh, urgency to immunize our own population uh, is not that uh, intensive. So I think uh, China won't be competing for a lot of the vaccines that once, uh, you know, uh, developed and produced out there. And also, if you look at the terms that we have with uh, COVAX very carefully, we only, China negotiated with uh, COVAX, with Gavi, 
uh, to purchase only uh, 1,500, 15 uh, million uh, uh, doses. So um, it's only 1% of the population. It's carefully calculated on the one hand to build up the purchasing power of COVAX so that they would have the power to negotiate with the providers, the suppliers to bring down price. At the same time, it's not a large chunk uh, of the amount so that China won't be taking from other developing other countries, not just developing countries, uh, the amount that they actually need because actually within China, our uh, production capacity is uh, adequate if that answers the question. Yes, thank you very comprehensively. Uh, Secretary Afroz, I'd like to turn to you about this whole vaccine issue. Um, wh where is, how is Bangladesh feeling with a huge population? You've seen that some of the vaccines are being developed at very close third stage and hopefully to be deployed in the new year. Where, how is Bangladesh feeling about its ability to vaccinate its population once a vaccine is available? Maybe you could turn your video on as well. Yes, yes, just give me a minute. Yes, uh, yes, this is so important that Bangladesh is, you know, a hugely populated country and uh, vaccination is so important. So our government is uh, giving the, you know, uh, effort, you know, uh, so how can we manage and we have been have a research cell and, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, government coordination. So both China and India have supplied Bangladesh with COVID-19 uh, related uh, medical aid, uh, with India also promising Bangladesh early access to a successful uh, vaccine as well. The US sees Bangladesh as one of the key partners in the Indo-Pacific region and will continue with support for you know, this uh, vaccination issues. So uh, we have our, uh, you know, Ministry of Health uh, and there is a, a big committee with the headed by the minister and as well as the secretary and other, uh, you know, concerned ministries have a coordinated approach. We are engaging our NGOs, we are engaging our development partners and of course civil society uh, have a consultation and uh, taking different measures that uh, it is so important uh, uh, to have. But also um, uh, China is also on the line for providing us with vaccine, but it's a government decision. So we are still in the decision-making process, but we are very serious how to get this vaccination, you know, and can really uh, help support our population to get vaccinated during this uh, pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. I'd like to turn to Professor Kwan again. And uh, you have, in your presentation and also in the Q&A, you've talked about new directions, possible new directions and directives for Korean development cooperation. But in your reflection on how, how Korea has responded to COVID-19, what have you seen as the geographical or sectoral shifts? We saw the Asia Foundation, we saw a lot of shifts and pivoting of resources towards new areas as a result of COVID-19. COVID We're not sure if those are going to sustain over the long term, you know, how other areas have hurt as a result in terms of prioritization, prioritization by donors. What are you seeing in the Korean context in terms of new areas that are emerging as priorities as a result of COVID? Well, I think, uh, uh... Of course, we uh, uh, react to the crisis and we provide the emergency support. But I don't think uh, the, 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 the COVID will uh, change the basic uh, the policy, but we are in the middle of the process of the next five midterm plan. So uh, the, of course, COVID-19 will be taken into consideration, but we have more overall uh, discussion inside Korea, how, how we set up, we established the uh, mid-term uh, ODA plan. So I, I, I think we need to see. Uh, so uh, some change, but uh, it, it will be because of many things. Well, just to, can I uh, answer one of the question uh, directed to me about the freedom and the COVID-19 uh, lockdown and these things. Please do. And I, I think uh, the, the, 
Of course, we need to respond to COVID-19 pandemic, but the freedom is not something easy to uh, sacrifice. I think we need to preserve individual freedom. So uh, this is very important democratic values. So we have uh, COVID-19 and individual freedom. So you need to be very careful not to inter a fringe in individual right. But at the same time, to enjoy your freedom, you don't, you don't need to, I mean, you shouldn't hurt other people's right to be health. So I think how to balance these two things. Uh, but for, for example, uh, when you do uh, trace and track, uh, then you must be very careful about the individual privacy, how to protect information you get. Uh, but at the same time, we need to cooperate together to, to react as a community to this uh, threat. So I think uh, it is very important to balance. I don't think anything easily to sacrifice. Thank you for bringing my attention to that question. It was a, a very important one and mm -hmm. very different responses on that issue across the world, uh, even with countries. It's a highly contested issue. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Wong, just to go back to my earlier question then about prioritization shifting, let's say in Chinese South-South cooperation development cooperation, the Health Silk Road, for example, which has become quite important as a result of COVID, do you see that expanding um, post-COVID? Is that going to be a, an even stronger pillar of Chinese development cooperation going forward? Well, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. And I hope that um, ways of delivering our assistance could be, you know, innovated also, because we could also see during this pandemic, the power of uh, digitalization. In fact, um, the digital economy and some digital technologies, uh, digital economy really worked and also digital uh, technology could be utilized in the health setting as well, especially uh, for delivery of services for the last mile. So I hope to see that happening. So we, we'll need to wait and see. Thank you. I think that brings us to the end. We're almost exactly on time. Thank you all very much. We, we hope the session has provided a, a better understanding of Asian countries' needs, policy responses, and development cooperation plans to harness resources and actions to address the unfolding challenges and opportunities posed by the pandemic. We've heard very good ideas, very strong words, uh, and also some positive actions that are occurring in the countries that we're all involved today both on the partner country side in terms of providers and clearly how Bangladesh as a country is taking action, not sitting back and waiting for someone to come and help, but has a very positive and proactive um, plan for the future. So please join me in a virtual round of applause for our excellent speakers today and all the contributors to the rich discussion. We, that's my virtual round of applause. And we hope to see you all again tomorrow same time, but please note that it is a different Zoom link tomorrow. There are different Zoom links for tomorrow and the next day. I will see you at the same time um, on, on the Zoom channel. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, moderator, for excellent moderation today. Pleasure to have you all with us. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much.